So what we're going to do this morning is the first of a series of three talks on life and death on a blue planet, which of course is planet Earth. Geologists divide the Earth's history up into four large eons, the most recent of which is the Phanerozoic. And the Phanerozoic is the one we'll be talking about in this presentation. It is further divided into four eras, the oldest being the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the youngest, the one we're in today, is the Cenozoic. So we're going to start today with life and death in the Paleozoic era. And then next week, we'll pick it up with life in the Mesozoic era, and then finish in three weeks with life and death in the Cenozoic. So we start with life and death in the Paleozoic, the oldest of those three periods. And what we're going to be doing is sort of setting the stage. We'll look at the fuses that lead to an explosion of diversity, the greening of the planet, the conquering of the land by the animals, and then death on an unprecedented scale. And so we start with setting the stage. And it starts basically 4.6, 4.7 billion years ago when a newly formed star, which is our sun, was encased in a great cloud of debris. And that debris, the larger chunks by gravitational pull, attracted the smaller chunks. And eventually, they coalesced into a planet. And about 4.6 billion years ago, planet Earth took its origin. The first eon of Earth's history is called the Hadean, and it was rather hellish time. It was hot bombardment, kind of full time by meteors and asteroids. It was not a pleasant time to be on the planet. Nothing could have lived here at that time. But toward the end of the Hadean and extending on into the next eon, the Archean, the rains came and puddles became ponds and ponds became lakes and lakes became seas. And finally, we have about 3.7 billion years ago, the ocean. And in these waters, complex organic cells began to form. And some of these were able to replicate themselves. And when that happened, life had arrived on planet Earth. The oldest fossils we have are called stromatolites and they're kind of wrinkly features in limestone. And for many years, geologists didn't know what they were until the 1950s, when very similar structures were found in a bay on the north side of Australia. And it was determined that they were created by blue grain algae or cyanobacteria. They created these structures and did a lot of other things as well. You could see them today, they're still around in great abundance because they're the chloroplasts in plants and the leaves and green that you see in the, in the plants. But back then they were in the water and some of them forming these algal mounds that occurred on the surface. Now the cyanobacteria don't require oxygen for their growth, but they do produce it as a byproduct of photosynthesis. So all the time that they were growing and developing and creating stromatolites, they were producing oxygen that was first added to the ocean and then ultimately to the atmosphere. And that was pretty much devastating to almost all the other organisms that lived on the planet at that time because they were anaerobic. They couldn't exist in the presence of oxygen. And so that led to the first global extinction, fairly lengthy one that occurred around two and a half to 2.2 billion years ago. 
And at the same time, we had the first widespread ice on the Earth's surface. And it's not real clear what the connection was, if any, between the changing atmosphere, uh, the increased oxygen in the atmosphere, and the change in the climate. But that was another wrinkle that was devastating to a lot of the organisms that had developed at that point. So that was the, the first widespread ice. And we really don't know if there was a linkage between the change in the atmosphere and that ice or what, but it was another factor in the, the extinction. And then the earth goes into a really remarkable period of about one and a half billion years. And in that time, there's basically no change. The, the cellular structure changes of some of the organisms that leads to the, the organisms of today, but otherwise not much change. We get to six to 800 million years ago, we have another glacial episode. And to what extent that factors in the, the falling information, I don't know, but it may have been an important one. But basically that ended this long phase of which life was very, very simple and set us up for the explosion of life that occurs in the Phanerozoic. Now, the, the first of the eras in the Phanerozoic is a Paleozoic era. And it's divided by geologists into a number of periods. And these are some tens of millions of years old. And I've shown them here stacked up, but in the following slides, what you're going to see is a bar across the bottom that gives these ages. And there'll be an arrow or a bar or something that tells you where we are in terms of the time scale. But when you see this bar across the bottom, what we're looking at is the, the timing and the age within the Paleozoic. And it started with a bang, a real explosion of diversity where within a matter of some tens of millions of years, we have all of the phyla that we know today, the major divisions of life appear and a great explosion of diversity in the species as well, which were very limited in the time before that. So this takes us to our next topic, which is lighting the fuse to an explosion of diversity. The oldest known multicellular animal that we know at this time is a tiny little sponge that came from rocks in China and is dated at 600 million years. It's hard to say for sure that that's a sponge, but I know the author, Dave Botcher, is a good scientist and I trust his work. And he's a paleontologist and I'm, I'm sure he's, he's got this nailed as to what it is. But my question is, is it an animal? Well, take a look at sponges. They're, they're very simple organisms. They're basically vases or containers that allow water to circulate through. And that's pretty much what they are. And their walls consist of choanocytes, which are little cells with a flagella that beats. And when they all beat, they drive the momentum for propelling the water through the gaps into and through the sponge. And they're supported and fed by amoebocytes that can mobilize and move around. And the amazing thing is that the choanocyte, is the sponge cell, has a nearly identical free swimming individual animal called a choanoflagellate. And the two are, are very, very similar. And the choanoflagellates are known to form colonies. 
And in those colonies, they have amoebocytes that carry the nutrients around just as they do in a sponge. And as far as I could tell, the only difference between a choanoflagellate colony and a sponge is the degree of organization. You can take a sponge, put it in a blender, run it through cheesecloth, and within a matter of hours, it starts to reconstitute itself. This is not something that an individual animal does, but it is something that can be done by a colony. So the question is, when we look at a fossil sponge, are we seeing an animal or are we seeing a colony of animals? And why this is important is the next phase of the fossils that were found in a period of time right before the Paleozoic begins, it's called the Edicarian period, it gets its name from the Edicarian Hills of Australia, where some years ago, geologists, paleontologists found remarkable imprints in the sediment. They never found any parts of the, these organisms. Nothing was preserved except the imprint. And it turns out that they are present all over the world in rocks of that age. And so the question is, were these individual organisms or were these colonies of organisms? One of them looks remarkably like a modern sea pen, which is today a colonial organism. Another one looks quite similar to an extant colony of hydroids. So what are these things and, and were they colonies? Were they animals? One thing we know is they were immobile because there are no tracks or trails in the Edicarian rocks or rocks of that age that go along with these strange fossils, fossil imprints. Until we get right to the very end, about 555 million years ago, and then we start seeing small traces in the sediment. So it looks like the transition from the Eocarian period to the Paleozoic era is marked by a change that allows for mobility. Prior to about 555, 560 million years, something like that, we only had drifting organisms. But after that, we have organisms that can move. This is a Krebs cycle. I'm not going to try to explain it because I don't understand it at all. But it is a fundamental part of life. And what I do know is that oxygen is not part of it, but oxygen is required to convert the products of the Krebs cycle into energy, into growth or to movement. And estimates of oxygen that have been made all show an increase around this particular period of time. The amount differs and was far less than the oxygen levels that we have today, but it may well be that what happened was that the oxygen level in the seas increased to a point that allowed for mobility. And with mobility came predation. So the predator says, I'm going to eat you. And the prey says, I'll move faster. Well, I'll move faster too. Ah, I'll bury myself in the sand. I'll develop a way to dig and find you. I'll protect myself with a hard shell. I'll grow strong teeth to crush your shell. Hmm, that may be a problem. But I'll come up with something. And so what we have is an arms race, a sudden burst of diversity as animals 
develop the way to, to prey on other animals and the way to avoid that predation. And I think that probably accounts for this explosion of diversity that we see throughout the, the Cambrian period. Much of this information comes from a rock that's exposed in the Canadian Rockies called the Burgess Shale. And the Burgess is known for the exquisitely preserved fossils that are included. And these are really some pretty strange fossils like Hallucigenia, which gets its name, I'm sure, from how it looks. There's a reconstruction of it down on the lower part of the slide. And they disappeared by the end of the Cambrian. But some biologists think that their descendants are still around today in the form of velvet worms that live in the tropics. They're not really worms. You can see they have what amounts to legs and they're predators. They have a nasty way of devouring a prey by sort of encasing it in a sticky mucus and then eating it. So even though Hallucigenia has long departed the scene, its descendants today may still be the stuff of nightmares. But there were a lot of the Cambrian fossils that looked like animals that we have today, mollusks, clams, snails, echinoderms like sand dollars and sea urchins, arthropods like shrimp or lobsters, and brachiopods. Brachiopods are an animal that I suspect most of you have never seen alive because they are deep water. But I have seen them growing on the rocks from a research submersible and the upper limbs of or the upper stretches of Monterey Submarine Canyon, where they live on the rocks of the, the canyon wall. And then there are the trilobites. And the trilobites are really kind of the marvelous animals of the entire Paleozoic. They make for beautiful fossils. You can, I don't know if I can get this up to where you can, yes, there we go. There is a trilobite fossil, but they do make gorgeous fossils and there are none of them left today, but they inhabited the, the Paleozoic seas from the, almost the beginning to the end. So that was life in the sea. 500 million years ago. Lots and lots of strange organisms. And some of them were big. Anomalocaris was a big shrimp. It was a big predatory shrimp, the likes of which I'm glad I never had to worry about when I was working underwater. I think the most weird animal of all of the Cambrian is Opabenia. It has five eyes. And for a mouth, something that looks very much like a set of ice tongs. So there are some really strange animals that lived and did not survive out of the Cambrian. But one of the important ones was Picaya, which had a notochord, which is a precursor to a spinal cord. And all the vertebrates, everything with a backbone, can trace its origins back to these primitive Cambrian cordings. We may carry the genes of an animal like this. So that was the explosion of diversity, a really remarkable time in the history of the earth. So we'll move on now. The land surface 500 million years ago was barren, even though the sea was full of algae. And it was probably this algae that raised the oxygen levels in the atmosphere that allowed for all of that development of life in the Cambrian. But it was restricted to the sea. The landscape was as barren as 
or change the surface of Mars. But it didn't stay that way. So we're going to next look at the greening of a planet. Plants may go back a long way. There are some fossils or possible fossils that are a billion years old that look very much like multicellular marine algae that have been found in China. And so the plants may have a long, the marine plants may have a long, long history that's not particularly well recorded. But they didn't come ashore until the middle part of the Ordovician, about 470 million years ago. And some of the earliest land plants probably derived from an algae like. Carophyta. And it's a huge transformation to go from a marine terophyte to a shoreline dwelling land plant. You have to make some really significant changes. And one of these changes is waterproofing. Because if you're going, if you're a plant and you're going to be out of the water, you can't have the water evaporate out and desiccate the entire organism. So what they developed was a wax cuticle, a skin that was essentially waterproof as a cover. But that's not enough because the plant also has to take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and it has to discharge waste products. And it did that by tiny little stomata, little pores, it could be opened and allow carbon dioxide to enter and waste products to escape, but then close the rest of the time to secure the water and retain the water within the plant. And that's basically how plants work today. Some of the earliest plants probably looked like this liverwort, a modern day primitive plant. And the Ordovician shoreline may have looked something like this. Essentially, wherever there was water, there was the possibility for plants to grow as long as they were at the water. But the plants were going to move away from the water. And to move away from the water required another evolutionary process, and that was the, the development of a vascular system in which they had two kinds of tubes, one zillum that was basically watertight and you know, was a, a water main that brought the water from the roots up to the rest of the plant, and the phloem, which took the sugar that was derived from the leaves, the energy material, and distributed to the rest of the plant for growth. And once it had developed this system, then it could draw its water from the roots and no longer needed to be tied to standing bodies of water. One of the plants that is thought to be transitional to the vascular plants was called Cooksonia, found all over the world. And it uh, may have formed meadows that extended away from the water line. So plants were able to move away from the water, but they couldn't really get big until there was soil. And they had to be instrumental in producing the soil. The root systems caused a breakdown of the rocks and all of them produced enough soil that you could have large root systems that could support trees. And so the Devonian, when we get to the Devonian, we see the first true forests develop. And these forests were made of trees that are very foreign to us today. I don't know of any of them that, that existed to the present time. But it was a time that the continents were moving in such a way that was going to impact these forests. And 
the continents were merging, forming a supercontinent, and much of the area that we know as North America and Europe and China all lay fairly close to the equator in a wet zone. And so what we have at that time are forests developing during the early Carboniferous in a very wet climate, essentially rainforests. And they're full of strange trees and some very large insects. There was a lot of photosynthesis and today, photosynthesis is pretty much balanced by respiration the, the, by the plants and, and particularly the animals that we're breathing. We're taking oxygen out of the atmosphere just as the trees outside our, our window are putting it in. During the Carboniferous, there basically were very, very few land animals and the ones that were there were pretty sluggish. So oxygen built up to levels, maybe 30% of the atmosphere, whereas today it's about 21%. And so the atmosphere in the Carboniferous is, is quite rich in oxygen. And this produced some very strange insects, dragonflies with a wingspan of about two feet, cockroaches the size of bedroom slippers, and a centipede-like animal that was six to eight feet long. So some very strange insects developing in these rainforests of the Carboniferous. Some of the trees look kind of familiar, and if they do, it's because they have modern counterparts that probably all of you have seen today. The equisetums were producing trees when they were back in the Carboniferous. But most of the trees were trees of the kinds that don't exist today, a very specific development of the forests of the Carboniferous. By the end of the Carboniferous, we're seeing the first conifers and first chordates. And so pine trees are starting to appear for the first time on the surface of the planet. Flowering plants may have originated during the Paleozoic, but it's not real clear. And they may have originated considerably after that. So we're not sure when they, they developed, but they could have developed as well during the Paleozoic. So by the time we get to about 330 million years ago, the greening of the earth was completed. The trees, vegetation has covered the planet wherever there's sufficient water and temperature to allow it to exist. So if we're moving on to our next topic, which is conquering the land. We noted before that Picaia was a precursor to the the animals that have a backbone today. And the first known fish is something called Metaspringia, which shows up in the about the middle Cambrian. If I encountered this thing underwater, I'm not sure I'd recognize it as a fish, but that's what the biologists say it was. By the time we get into the Ordovician, we have true fish. The fish that first originated lacked jaws. And we still have jawless fish today in the form of hagfish and lamprey eels. But most of the fish we've got have jaws. Now, some of these early jawless fish were pretty bizarre. The astracoderms were armored and unlike any fish that we, we see today. The earliest known jawed fish show up in the lower part of the Silurian and they grew to take over the marine environment, particularly during the Devonian, which is known as the age 
of the fish. And there were things like a placoderm, an armored fish. It was 30 to 35 feet long, really a, a monster of the marine world. And the earliest sharks developed also in the middle of the Devonian. Sharks having a cartilaginous skeleton. But bony fish had arrived somewhat earlier back during the Silurian. The earliest known bony fish was probably this one. And it's starting to look like a real fish. These early fish divided rather quickly into two different groups. Those that had ray fins, where the fins extended out from the body as a set of rays, and the lobe fin fish, which were different in that if we look at a modern example like the coelacanth or the Australian lungfish, the fins develop on fleshy projectiles that extend out from the body. And these fleshy projectiles could be used to help move a fish creep along the bottom. And they crept up into shallow water. And with time, they developed the ability to breathe air and to move about on the surface. And so we had the first amphibians. This is actually a living tiger salamander but I couldn't resist that grin. We know they were on land because they left tracks. And the earliest footprints that were made by a tetrapod, an animal with four feet or four legs, is in the early Devonian about nearly 400 million years ago. So we know from the tracks that they were out on land. Now, the amphibians came ashore probably for protection to get away from any predators who might be there. And then also maybe to feed because the early ones appear to be vegetarian and there was a lot of plant growth along the Devonian shorelines. But even though they could get away from the water, they still remained bound to it. And that was because their eggs and larvae were still subaqueous, like tadpoles. And being subaqueous meant they were subject to predation. So for an egg to survive, one of the strategies would be to deposit it in the shallowest possible water where maybe a predator wouldn't be able to get to it. But there it runs a risk of drying out. And the eggs that would have the greatest chance of survival would be the ones with the thickest and most impervious shells. And with time, these shells got thicker and more impervious and eventually didn't need water at all. And we went from amphibian eggs to reptile eggs, where the little reptile has all the water it needs inside the egg and then when it's grown to a sufficient point, it breaks out and is ready to take on the world. And this happens basically around the end of the Carboniferous that we're showing this particular one here. The earliest confirmed reptile is Hylenomus. It was small and had sharp teeth. Now you'll notice that I've got a skull up there in the upper right-hand corner. And I hate to do this, but I need to talk a bit about vertebrate skulls. They come in three kinds, depending upon the number of holes behind the eye socket. The anapsids have no holes. The synapsid has one hole. And the diapsids have two holes. Anapsids with no holes are represented by the amphibians. The synapsids, today, all the mammals, including us, have synapsid skulls. And diapsids were snakes, crocodiles, lizards, dinosaurs, and birds today are all diapsid. 
And this provides a basis for identifying the family grouping of, of these fossils going back a long way in time. The oldest known synapsid shows up in the middle, the late part of the Carboniferous. This is an animal that is not too prepossessing, but it or something like it is something we can trace our own ancestry back to. The oldest known diapsid reptile comes a bit later, about 300 million years, still in the late Carboniferous. And that was the origin of the reptiles. And it couldn't have come at a better time because in the late Carboniferous, there was a collapse of the rainforest. There was glaciation in the Southern hemisphere, sea level fell, the climate changed, and the amphibians, for the most part, didn't survive this. But the reptiles, well, they were no longer bound to the water, so they could move about. And as we go into the Permian, we reach the age of the synapsid reptiles. If you ever had a bag of plastic dinosaurs or around a child who had a bag of plastic dinosaurs, you probably saw the sailbacked lizard named Dometrodon, and it's not a dinosaur. It's not even related to the dinosaurs. It's more related to us because it is a synapsid reptile. And these synapsid reptiles dominated the whole Permian period. The sailback lizards didn't make it to the end. For some reason, there is a gap in the sedimentary record called Olson's Gap, and Pelicosaurs don't extend beyond that. But their relatives, the therapsids, which are also synapsid in their skulls, do survive. And these are some really strange animals. Probably furry, they almost look like mammals, but they're still reptiles, they still lay eggs, they don't suckle their young. There were some pretty nasty predators that lived at that time. Uh, some of them were quite large, some of them were pretty strange, and some of them were very strange. But they essentially took over the last part of the Permian. One of the ones that occurred near the end of the, the Permian was a little animal called a synodont, which means dog tooth. And you notice there's sort of a fang that extends down from the mouth, which is where it gets its name. And its importance lies in the fact that they are thought to be the animals that later on will generate the mammals, including us. In the meantime, the diapsids with the two holes in the skull were mostly small, lizard-like. They were not very large or very important during this period of time. But we now can sort of look back and see how these different organisms developed and you can see during the Devonian, the branching off the amphibians, and then during the late Devonian, early Carboniferous, the branching off of the reptiles, and eventually the conquering of the earth. And this was facilitated by the plate tectonics because the Paleozoic was a time where the continents were merging. And by the end of it, 260 million years, they had merged to a supercontinent called Pangaea. This continent allowed for essentially the unimpeded movement, migration of animals to all parts of the continent that could be sustained life. So basically, 
the earth surface is conquered by the vertebrates, by the animals. And at the Permian, the synapsid vertebrates dominate the land. But that was going to change. It was going to change because of death on an unprecedented scale. Because the end of the Paleozoic era occurs in a tragedy. There have been a number of extinctions in the Earth's history. We'll talk more about this in the subsequent lectures. But you'll notice this one in the middle at the marking the boundary between T and P with a big triangle. The number of genera, which are, are groups of species, is diminished to a point that hadn't been seen since the Cambrian. It was a huge toll of life that occurred during that particular time. 96% of the marine species and 70% of the land species died. What happened? Well, we think there was very extensive volcanism in one place. And that volcanism derived from a really large, what geologists call a hot spot in the upper mantle, where rising plumes from the lower mantle and core come up and generate a really hot mass that melts the rocks above. And these erupt in the form of volcanoes. And in a place like the middle Pacific, where the Pacific plate is moving across the top of this hot spot, you get a volcanic eruption, the formation of an island, and then the plate movement carries it away, and you get the Hawaiian Island chain, which is probably the best known of the products of the hot spot. But the hot spot that occurred 250 million years ago was in what today is Siberia. And it was just an immense outpouring of lava, changing the atmosphere, really changing the world. But it wasn't just that. When you get a volcanic eruption from molten rock, it goes up and breaks through the sediment, sedimentary layers in the forms of dikes but it also can follow within the layers and produce a horizontal molten rock body called a sill. And the rocks it was going through were an extensive coal field. Now the coals had developed during the Carboniferous. It's known as the age of coal. And we had those extensive forests and the Carboniferous, the organisms that decompose wood like fungi and certain kinds of bacteria had not yet come on the scene. So all of that carbon from the trees was incorporated into the sediment. And there, once it was in the sediment, under sufficient heat and pressure, it was turned to coal. And the intrusion of the molten rock into those thick coal layers burned them and generated vast amounts of carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas that entered the atmosphere and really changed the earth, not only from the gas itself, but also from the heating that it caused. Because the Permian surface temperatures, the late Permian surface temperatures are thought to be really much higher than the temperatures we have today. So that was how the Permian ended. 96% of the marine species. Why so many things dying out, including the trilobites? And the trilobites had been around 
for basically the entire period of the Paleozoic era. Well, if you heat water up, warm water can contain less oxygen than cold water. So the warmer it is, the less oxygen is available. And the sea surface temperatures rose to very high levels during the Permian. And as a result, there were vast marine dead zones where essentially nothing lived. And so the trilobites, which had existed a century for the entire Paleozoic, succumbed at the end of it. So that is the story of the Paleozoic era. It starts with an explosion of diversity, incurs the green of the planet and the conquering of the planet by the animals. All of that happens during the Paleozoic, but it ends with death on an unprecedented scale. So next week, we're going to follow on in the aftermath of that death. And we'll look at life and death in the Mesozoic era. So that finishes the Paleozoic.